We're familiar with the sight of a signalman in a signal box pulling levers to make trains move. But what is he actually doing? To understand the need for signals, it's always good to look at where everything started. So let's go back to the early days of railways, to the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. Now, I'm going to need you to use your imagination for some of this, because first of all, they would not be wearing a high-vis vest. And second of all, that signal in the background, ignore it, doesn't exist yet. In the same way that when they built the first road, they probably didn't think about traffic lights. When they built the first railway, they probably didn't think about signals. The idea was simple. You have two tracks, one dedicated for trains going in one direction and one dedicated for trains going the other way. And all you had to do was essentially rely on the driver not to whack into the train in front of him. Sounds a bit precarious, I know. But you've got to bear in mind that in the early days, trains weren't exactly fast. If you were doing about 25, 30 miles an hour, you were having a good day and a high speed run at that. Now, the complication arose when you started mixing fast trains with slow trains or putting a lot of trains over the same bit of line. What do you do? Well, you have people called flagmen, and essentially their job is to be based along the line at regular intervals with a red flag and a stopwatch. The idea being, as soon as a train passes, they display their flag and start their stopwatch, and they will not let another train pass until a certain time has elapsed. Let's say 20 minutes. Now that's all fine, it's called time interval working, and it did sort of work, but it had one potentially fatal flaw. Time interval working worked, assuming the train got to the other end of the section. You see, what happens if your train, for example, breaks down? I'll tell you exactly what happens, you have a crash 20 minutes later. Not ideal. Now the invention of a telegraph did sort, solve many of these problems because signalmen could actually communicate with each other. But it still wasn't ideal, and frankly, on a cold, wet, gloomy day, trying to see a red flag is not the easiest thing. So, they managed to mechanise it. Let's go to Ropley. Welcome to Ropley Signal Box. Originally based in Netley, it was moved here as the railway expanded. Now, this may look confusing, so let me take you through what we're looking at here. At the top, we have the line schematic. This is the area that's under the signalman's control. So, we've got our platform one, which is on the other side, platform two, this is down to Walsford, and up there is up to Medicine and Formarks. The next thing are the levers. These are what the signalman actually pulled to control. So, the reds are the signals, the blacks are the points, the blues are facing point locks, the yellows are distance signals, and whites are just spare levers. Unfortunately, at the moment, we have no idea if a signal, when we pull a lever, is actually doing what it's supposed to, which is what these brass indicators are for. Now, these may look a bit um, weird. You want a signal to say whether it's kind of green or red. But what it actually shows you is if the signal is on, it's showing its red aspect. So you can just picture the red light is on. If it's showing off, it means the lever's been pulled and it's been detected at the clear aspect. If the wire gets too hot, in the summer especially, it can expand a little bit and develop slack, which means the signal won't pull off all the way and it will look a bit like this. That's what happens when in the summer, the wires heat up and they stretch out just a little bit. Now, there is actually something the signalman can do. He can actually use special instruments to tighten the wires, but you need to be careful. Otherwise, if you tighten it too much, the wire could snap and you will not be popular with the signaling technicians. So what does the signalman actually do? Well, let's say I've got a train coming from Alton that needs to go through Ropley. Now, there's currently a set of coaches in the other platform and the points are set for that platform. So we need to move the points somehow and then clear the signal by pulling those levers. So let's do that. So first thing we need to do is change the points. Now, when he moves the lever, it goes down into an interlocking room below, 
out across and starts moving rodding to actually push the points over. Once we're in the right place, we need to ensure that the points are not going to move. So we use a facing point lock, which essentially is a bit of metal that slots into another slot and that will physically lock the points in position. So uh, Jim, can you try pulling uh, number 21 points? Those points are now physically locked. We cannot put those points back underneath a train, which is a very good thing considering you want the train to stay on the rails. Now the road's set, we need to let the driver know that it is safe to proceed. So if we pull lever 28, which we can see from our schematic, once again it goes down into the relay room, out across two wires, and pulls the signal off. Now, I want to show you what interlocking looks like. Essentially, interlocking is a fail-safe device to make sure we as signalmen do not do anything stupid. A stupid thing at this point would be to try and pull the signal next to it, uh, namely number 24. Jim, can you try and pull 24? It won't go. That is what mechanical interlocking looks like. It will physically lock the levers and won't let you do anything stupid. So this is another bit of the interlocking. Essentially, what you have are metal bars with slots cut into them. One metal bar will slot into another one and that will form the lock. And that means it's really hard, if not impossible, to pull that lever. And there you have it, we've moved the points over, we've locked them so we know they're not going to move under a train and clear the signal to tell the driver it's safe to proceed. Easy. There is one thing I've overlooked and um, it's an obvious one. How do you tell where your train is? Now there's a, an easy way to do it, you uh, can look out the window. Not always available. Uh, especially in the dark or very poor visibility. So what they did was invent a technology called track circuitry. If you look at our schematic, you can see there's a couple of red lights dotted around. Those are the trains. Now track circuitry works. Essentially, you pass a small voltage up one rail, across to a relay, and then back down. If the relay can detect that voltage, it knows there's nothing in that track section, so it will not show up as anything. However, if you put a train over it, the train will short out that voltage, so it'll go up the rail, through the train, and back down. And the relay won't detect anything. In the relay's mind, it's showing up as a fault, a red light. Now, if you talk to any uh, signalling technician, they'll say the track circuit proves the non-presence of a train, because when a train appears, it shows up as a fault. And that's how you tell where the train is. Now, you can go even more intelligent. You can actually use interlocking to work with this technology. So, for example, you can't throw a set of points underneath a train. But that's all well and good. However, there is still a problem with single lines. Let me show you. See, the thing with single lines, it sounds obvious, but there's only one of them. So what do you do if you need to run trains in both directions? You can't really rely on the driver to look where he was going and try and stop before the train hit him because that became tiresome when they're going the same direction. It's a recipe for disaster if they're going towards each other. So they invented a thing called a staff. Now a staff essentially is a chunk of metal which is unique. It has the name of the section it applies to inscribed on it. So for example, I'm currently in the middle of the Ropley Medstead section. So if I brought a train with me, I'd need the Ropley Medstead staff. Perfect. There's only one of these staffs and the drivers are on strict orders that they are not allowed to enter the section without this staff. Foolproof. What could possibly be bad about it? Well, it wasn't flexible. See, what happens if you have to send, let's say, three trains in the same direction before one comes back? The Ropley Medstead section is quite long. So you could even employ a man and a horse to go to the other end of the section to get the staff ready for the next train which is nothing short of a little bit ridiculous. So, they invented a thing called a ticket. Now the idea is, is you see the staff and you get given a paper ticket on the understanding that you've seen the staff and that you will then go into the next section knowing that the staff is gonna follow you behind on the last train. Perfect. But unfortunately it wasn't as easy as that. You see, it still wasn't as flexible and you still occasionally needed that man on the horse. So what did they do? A man called Edward Tyre came up with a clever system. Lots of staff kept in special instruments at each end of the section which were locked in such a way 
that you could only physically withdraw one at a time. This man was called Edward Tyre and he invented the token system, a brilliant invention because now you had safety and flexibility and this system is still in use on parts of a national network to this day. The token machines could go one step further, they could be interlocked with the signals themselves. We currently do not have a token to take a train from Bopley to Medstead. But we're going to do something stupid. We're going to try and send a train to Bopley to Medstead by pulling the signals and trying to clear them into the section. Jim? That's called electronic interlocking. The system knows the token has not been withdrawn from this end, so it will not clear the signal. If you want a good example of when this goes wrong, look up the Abermule train crash. It was a mix of failings in the system and also the people operating it. Now, you can find lever things like this out on the national network, but eventually it was going to evolve and it was going to go one stage further. But we're out of time, so that is one for next week. So tune in next Friday to see Alton Box and beyond, where we go onto the national network. I've got a real treat lined up for you guys, so make sure you're there to see it. Now, normally at this point, I would run the credits with some sort of drone footage in the background or something, just in the background. But I couldn't really think of anything to run with this. So here's a little treat. Occasionally we do get outtakes, which um, obviously you don't see because they're outtakes. So here's one we had in the box earlier where the interlocking, which is your fail-safe device to stop you doing anything stupid, did exactly what it was designed to do. And even though we didn't have any trains, it stopped us from doing something stupid. Thanks for watching guys, I'll leave you with that, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Same thing again, when he pulls the lever, that will go down into the relay room, if everything lines up as it should. Group correspondence is there. <laughs> 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 I thought he should have included that. Yeah. Yeah.